My, you guys are looking good today. I want you to turn to somebody and say, you look good. Some of you just lied in church. All right, so uh, mean it this time. Look at somebody and say, you look good today. Look, those of you online, I cannot see you. I'm assuming that some of you are in your pajamas, and so I'm not going to say you look good, all right? But uh, you might want to turn to somebody in your home. If you're, wa- if you're watching all alone, look in the mirror and say, you look good today, all right? But we're so glad that you're here today, and we're very excited about this series that we're in. We're talking about an unshakable faith. How do you build an unshakable faith? Would you agree with me that there are storms in life? that shake your faith. They will, if you're not careful, they will shake you to your core. They will knock you off course. The devil, your enemy, will do everything that he can to get your mind off of King Jesus, get your mind off the grace of God, and cause you to question God's love for you, cause you to question God's plan for you, cause you to question whether or not God really is in control. And so it is important to build a faith that can survive those storms. Last week, we began by talking about building an unshakable faith in the Word of God. And the reason that we started with that is because it is from the Word of God that we learn about God. We learn what He's like. We learn how to have a relationship with Him. We learn what he does for us. We learn his attributes. We learn who he is. And so today, we're going to talk about the second building block. We're building building blocks for your faith. And what we want for you is mind and heart. Mind and heart. The Bible says, come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. And so God does not expect you to have faith without reason. In other words, he doesn't expect you just to have a blind faith. Now, you can build your faith to the point that no matter if you have answers to your questions or not, you can still trust God. But that's not a blind faith. Reason is the mind. And the Bible tells us, uh, beginning in the Old Testament, that our, our main job is to love the Lord our God with all our heart, all of our soul, and all of our strength or our mind. And so what does that mean? Well, it means loving him with your soul, loving him with your ability to reason, to think, loving him with your emotions, uh, and loving him with your will, your decision-making. And so that's what we're trying to do during this series is build an unshakable faith for you. And so today we're going to talk about building an unshakable faith in God. So that when difficulties come, when you don't have answers to all the questions, you can trust in God. In 1982, I enrolled in the local college there where I lived to take art classes. And my teacher, her name was Rose Cox. She was a very unusual person, a very, very good teacher. But in 1982, and I remember this because, you know, this is, this is how my mind works, like a steel trap, right? Uh, she was 82 in 1982, all right? That's not very hard to remember, is it? She was 82 years old in 1982, and I'll never forget the first day that I was in her class, uh, and she had us doing all kinds of stuff, but she told us that when she was about 19 or 20 years old, that for an entire year, get this, she studied under Picasso, Yes, that Picasso. And I thought, wow, how incredible is that? Now, I want you to understand something. Just because you take from a master does not make you a master. Just because you take from an expert does not make you an expert. I can take my car to an expert mechanic, doesn't make me a mechanic, okay? Um, I can go into my garage, does not make me a car, all right? But the fact is, This woman was an expert, and here's what she said, and I'll never forget this about what she said about art. She said, art is 90% sweat and 10% talent. Isn't that true of most things in life? 90% sweat, 10% talent. Now, what was she saying? She was saying that if you want to be good as an artist, you got to put the work in. 
You got to build on the fundamentals. Do you know that's true of everything in life? You want to be a a good mechanic, you got to get the fundamentals down. If you don't know how to change oil or where the gas uh, tank is, you're probably not going to be a very good mechanic. If you want to be a math teacher, guess what you've got to do? If you don't learn two plus two equals four, and you don't learn all the basics and the building blocks of mathematics, you're never going to be a good mathematician or a good teacher. If you want to be a good husband or a good wife, guess what you need to learn? You need to learn some fundamentals. You need to learn the building blocks. You need to learn how to build on a strong foundation. And when it comes to building faith in God, we must build on a strong foundation. So today, my goal is mind and heart, mind and heart. So I'm going to give you, first of all, some things that are going to challenge your mind. They're going to help you think. They're going to help you in dealing with other people uh, that may have questions about God. And then, of course, we're going to deal with your heart, which is how you can learn more about your relationship with God and how much he loves you and what he is like and what he thinks about you. So this is a building block that helps the finite, we are the finite, um, have a relationship with the infinite, which is God. Now, if you think for a moment that you can comprehend fully everything about God, then um, you, you really are deceiving yourself because Anyone that is finite, just simply by definition, it is impossible to fully understand the infinite. Do you you understand that? Do you agree with that? The fact is, no matter how hard you try, does that mean you can't know about God? Absolutely not. You can have a relationship with God. That's That's one of the amazing things about God. He is so vast and powerful and loving and infinite and holy and just and righteous, and yet... Get this, he knows you more than anyone on this planet. He knows your shortcomings, your sins, your failures, and yet he loves you more than your mother, your father, or anyone that has ever walked this earth other than Jesus Christ. God knows you, and he loves you anyway. Isn't that amazing? We can know God. We can have a relationship with God. We can be intimate with God. Uh, He wants us to ask him questions. He wants us to learn more about him. He wants to be in relationship with us. But make no mistake about it, he is infinite. And uh, I I love what God asked Job. If you ever read the book of Job, very interesting book, it's kind of a, a, a play on what we go through in life. Now, I'm not suggesting that everybody goes through exactly what Job went through. He lost all of his wealth, all of his health, all of his family in one afternoon. That's incredible. I don't know many people that have suffered that much. But the point is that God and Job and his friends had this conversation And though Job maybe accused God of some things that he was not guilty of, I love how God responded to Job. And I believe this is a response of love. I want you to listen to what God asked Job. God asked Job, he said, where where were you when I created the universe? (laughs) Really, seriously, I'm going to tell God what to do with my life? Where were you, Richie, when I created the universe? And then he goes on and says, Do you really think you can instruct me or advise me? Now, how many of you are like I am? Uh, You've got a lot of advice for God. Anybody ever do that? Like, God, here's what you need to do. I I know. I know that some of you are not raising your hands because you're in church and you're afraid that I'm going to point you out. But the fact is, if you don't have your hand raised, you're probably lying. All right? That's all I'm saying. All right? So uh, turn to somebody and say, you a liar. No, I'm kidding. Don't do that. Don't do that. The truth is... You and I cannot advise God. Oh, we try. We like to tell him what we think is the best scenario, the best outcome, the best situation. But God knows more than we do. And so today, what I want to do is really answer three questions that will help us with mind and heart so that we can leave here today with a solid building block in our faith 
so that we can have an unshakable faith in God. Here's the first question I'm going to ask and try to answer today. But I'm going to give you that question after I read Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, two of my favorite verses in the Bible. Um, In the beginning, God. I love that. In the beginning, God. I want everybody to say that. In the beginning, God. It's up there. You can actually read it. Let's say it. In the beginning, God. Doesn't that kind of sum it all up? Before I ever existed, before my parents ever existed, before our ancestors ever existed, in the beginning, God. In the beginning, God was there. What that tells us is that he is outside of time and space. By the way, he could not have created everything were he not outside of time and space. He could not be eternal were he not outside of time and space. So don't let anybody bother you with their question about, well, where did God come from? Or, or you know, uh, uh, how did, uh, who created him? Or whatever. He's eternal. And the reason he's eternal is he is outside of time and space. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God hovered over the face of of the waters. Now, there's a whole lot in those two verses that we could mine and help ourselves to understand. But the main thing I want you to see was that in the beginning, God was there. In the beginning, God was there. This leads me to my very first question Does God exist? Now, I would imagine that for most of you, uh, you settled that question a long time ago. Uh, In fact, it's very unnatural. It goes against human nature and actually human mentality to believe that there is no God. It it goes against evidence to believe that there is no God. I mean, the fact is that we can look around us and it is so obvious that there is a God. But the question gets asked more and more, particularly in our culture that does not have a foundation of being rooted in the Word of God. The question gets asked. Many of you have, have been asked this question at work. Or in your neighborhood or with, from your friends, does God actually exist? Is he really real? Well, once again, Christianity is not just a religion, but it is about Jesus Christ and the fact that you and I can have reason. That it's not, God doesn't ask us just to accept blind faith, but he tells us to look at the evidence that God exists, that God loves us, that God has a plan for us, that God created everything. Look at the evidence. And for developing the mind and being able to take this philosophical approach to this question, um, I want to really encourage you to get your mind settled, if you are still questioning about the Bible, go back and listen to last week's message. I think it'll help you. But I want to take a philosophical approach to this so that you and I, when it comes to uh, answering a lost person's question about does God exist, well, it really doesn't do any good to tell a person that doesn't know if God exists what the Bible says. Because they don't even know if they believe in the Bible or not, okay? That would be like quoting Dr. Seuss to them, all right? But there is a philosophical approach and an evidentiary approach that we can look around us and we can determine that, yes, there is overwhelming evidence that there is a God. Let me give you four of the most, uh, I believe, helpful and critical arguments for the existence of God. We could talk about this for days and weeks and months I just want to give you four that if you don't write these down, you can go back and look at the uh, Bible app and you can look at these notes during the week and and refresh your memory. But here they are. I want to give you um, uh, four. And if you want to read further on this, I would encourage you to read William Lane Craig's Five Arguments for God and Norman Geisler's Baker Encyclopedia of Christian Apologetics on the Existence of God. You read those two things, it'll give you all the information that you probably can handle at this point. So here are the four arguments for God. First of all is the cosmological argument. You say, what is that? Well, it, the, the premise of this argument is that everything that begins to exist has a cause. We don't see anything around us that exists that did not have a beginning. 
that did not have a cause. Now, I can take a watch, and this is just a kind of a, it's a G-Shock. I don't even know what brand that is, uh, to be honest, but it's just a pretty cheap watch. And um, it's got plastic and it's got some metal in it. But you know what I know about this watch? It did not just suddenly appear. I was not just walking into the store, wherever I got this, I don't even remember, to be honest, Walmart or Nike store or wherever. I did not just walk into a store and suddenly a watch manifested in front of me. Do you know what I know about this watch besides the fact that it's cheap and I can afford it? It had a beginning. It had a cause. There was somewhere a watchmaker that made this. Now, it's not a very expensive watch, and so it's probably made on a production line, and uh, somebody made the machines that made the watch. And what I know is that it is impossible for this watch to exist without someone causing it to exist. Now, that's with material that already exists. Think about God. He caused the universe to exist from nothing. Now, there are a lot of people that can cause a watch to exist or a house to exist or a car to exist because of their skill and their training and their tools. But you know what every one of them has before they cause that thing to exist? They have material to make it from. You know what God did? He made something from nothing. He made something from nothing. And we all know, logically speaking, that is impossible apart from a divine being, an intelligent designer, okay? So the cosmological argument is that everything that begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist, therefore the universe has a cause. It is logically true that when we use the cosmological argument that we can show evidence for the existence of God just from that one argument. Here's the second argument I want to give you, the teleological argument teleological argument. Um, This is all designs imply a designer. Now, once again, how many of you have a computer or a laptop computer or a uh, smartphone or an iPad or one of those kinds of things? You have one of those devices? How many of you have have those? Are you familiar with them at least? Um, There is no computer or phone that exists without a designer. It just doesn't happen. It's impossible. We know that it's logically uh, illogical for that not to be true. In other words, there must be a designer. So all designs imply a designer. There is a great design in the universe. Therefore, there must be a great designer of the universe. You see how logic proves that premise? Okay. So that is the teleological argument. Then third is the ontological argument. God is, by definition, an absolutely perfect being. So once again, we're talking about philosophy. We're talking about logic. We're not trying to prove this from the Bible because if you go to the Bible for the proof of God, you already believe that the Bible is the word of God or that God exists, okay? We're talking about logic, being able to not argue, win an argument. That's not the point of this. And by the way, if you have a person in your life, a friend that is an atheist, don't try to win arguments. You can use stuff like this to, to show the logic and the evidence But you know how we've had many people that came to this church that were atheists that got saved, and not a single one of them were saved because I beat them in an argument. Not a single one. But there were many that were saved because they saw the love of Christ in this church, and people treated them with respect and loved them. And that is how you win a person that doesn't know if they believe in God or not to Christ, okay? It's not through winning an argument. But the third argument is... The ontological argument that God is, by definition, an absolutely perfect being. That is part of the definition of God, okay? That is the very definition that he must be an absolutely perfect being because any being that is not absolutely perfect could not possibly be God. Does that make sense? Okay? So the ontological argument says that God is, by definition, an absolutely perfect being, but existence is a perfection. Okay, so in other words, any being cannot be perfect without existing, therefore, God must exist, okay? Now, for some of you, that was like, uh, I don't know, that, that was kind of out of my range a little bit, but you think through that, and, and it'll, you'll, it'll make sense to you. And then number four, and this, is, to me, is one of the most powerful arguments for the existence of God, the moral argument. 
If God does not exist, moral objective values and duties do not exist. Now, I want you to hang with me here for a second. Um, If there is no God, there is no absolute truth and absolute morality. Now, I want you to just listen to what I'm saying. From a logic and philosophical standpoint, this cannot be refuted. If there is no God, you cannot say that Hitler was wrong. You cannot say that because there is no absolute moral uh, standard if there is no God. If there is no God, there is no absolute moral standard, and therefore, you cannot say that murdering somebody is a sin or it's wrong. You say, well, that doesn't make sense. We all know that's wrong. How do we know that's wrong? If there is no moral objective, if there is no objective standard, then there is no God, and therefore, there is no right and wrong. It is only what we experience. It is only what we feel. It is only what we think. Let me take it a step further. If there is no moral right and wrong, if there is no objective standard, then you can abuse children with no recompense, with no problem whatsoever. Why? Because maybe that's wrong for you. Maybe you think that's wrong, but there is no objective standard of morality and right and wrong. And in my opinion, that's one of the strongest arguments for the existence of God. If God does not exist, objective moral values and duties do not exist. Objective moral values and duties do exist. We all know that whether we believe in the Bible or not, whether we believe in God or not, we know that it's morally wrong to hurt children. We know that it's morally wrong to break into someone's house and steal their stuff. We know that it's morally wrong to murder a human being. Therefore, because moral values and duties do exist, God exists. So those are the four arguments. There are many, many more, but I believe those are the four most powerful. These are good arguments for God's existence. They are logically valid. Their premises are true. Their premises are more plausible in light of the evidence than their negations. In other words, than if they were not true. So when you look purely at evidence from a scientific standpoint, from a philosophical standpoint, from a moral standpoint, you simply look at it in that light, you must come to the conclusion that there is overwhelming evidence for the existence of God. Therefore, in so far as we are rational people, we should embrace the evidence that God exists. And so uh, that's what I want to start out with today is the mind, how that we think through this. Let me go to the heart. Here's a second question. What is the nature of God? What is the nature of God? This is where our heart and our emotions and our will gets involved. Because if God is real, and he is, and he desires a relationship with us, and he does, then we need to know about that relationship. We need to know about his character. We need to know about what he is like. Now, once again, trying to put the nature of God into one point in one sermon uh, is impossible. We could spend years talking about this alone. But uh, I just want to give you a few thoughts and some verses about the nature of God, and then I'm going to give you some of the names of God that, uh, that contain uh, his uh, character and his attributes that help you understand how God feels about you, how God views you, what God sees when he looks at you. And by the way, I'm going to go ahead and let you know into the end of the story, because of the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, God, when you are a believer, when you put your faith in him, when he sees you, he does not see your sin. He does not see your failure. The Bible says, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. And what God sees when he looks at you is he sees the perfection of his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank God for that. Well, God is omnipotent. That simply means he has all power. God is omnipresent. That simply means uh, he's everywhere. That is not, you know, pantheism. God's not in this table, okay? Uh, The table is not God. But God is everywhere. And the point of that is you cannot escape him. You cannot escape his love. You cannot escape his power. You cannot escape his plan. Read Psalm 139. David wrote, he said, no matter where I go, 
you're there. And that is his omnipresence, which is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Do you remember what the angels announced when they announced that Jesus was going to be born? That he should be called what? Emmanuel, which means God with us. Friend, I want you to hear me. No matter how dark the night is, God is there with you. No matter how difficult the trial is, no matter how bad the pain is, God is right there with you. He has not left you alone. He knows you. He loves you. And he has a plan for your life. God is omnipresent no matter what you're facing. Sometimes it may feel like you're alone and sometimes the darkness may be so great that you cannot see properly, but just know that God is there. He's with you and he will never leave you or forsake you. God is omniscient. What does that mean? It means that he knows everything. Can you imagine, I want you to think about this with me. What kind of intellect, what kind of mind, What kind of thought process, what kind of power went in to creating this universe? (laughs) Now, I don't know if you're interested in that kind of stuff. I am very interested in it. I watch YouTube videos all the time about arguing for the existence of God and the philosophy of this, but also science and the, uh, the complexity of the universe and the complexity of just simply the human body. Did you know that we would not exist without DNA. I know you know this, but DNA is the most complex language in the history of the universe. And you know what the Bible says about God? I want you to get this. You know how God created? He spoke a language. He spoke words, and we came into existence. Can you imagine that that's why the Bible says that all things are created by him, and by him all things exist? The language of DNA is so incredibly complex that most of us can't even get our heads around it. Uh, the, the, the mathematics of the universe. And I love how uh, the Bible tells us that God did creation. It was so easy for him. I mean, I want you to listen. I'm gonna read some verses here. God is eternal, which I've already told you that he's outside of time and space. He is uncaused. In other words, he existed before time and space. He is infinite and he is absolute. But one of the things that I love most about God is that he is holy. He can never do wrong. He can never lie. He's holy. Without being absolutely holy and absolutely righteous and absolutely just, he would not be God. Because once again, remember that the very definition of God is, one of the definitions of God is that he is morally perfect. He cannot have any wrong, any failure. Uh, and I realize that some numbskulls will ask questions like this, and I, used to, and I include myself in that category because, you know, knuckleheads ask questions like this. Well, can God make a rock so big that he can't pick it up if he can do everything? Once again, the, th- the fact that God can do everything simply means that he does everything uh, that exists within his character and within his purpose. It doesn't mean that God can sin. Of course, he cannot sin because he's God. And of course, it doesn't mean that he can make a rock so big that he can't pick it up because let's be honest, I know your mom told you there are no dumb questions, but that's a dumb question, okay? So in spite of what your mom said, there are dumb questions, all right? So the greatest attribute of God And by the way, this is not an attribute. This is who he is. The Bible says that God has wrath. In other words, he judges sin. But the Bible does not say that God has love. Nowhere does the Bible say that God has love. You know what the Bible says about God? That he is love. He is the very definition of it. He is the very personification of it. He is the greatest example of it. He is love. Let me just read you a few verses. I love this. Psalm 145, verse 3. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. By the way, I chose all these verses here to uh, reflect the attributes that we just talked about. Go home this week, use this in devotions, read these verses, and see what it tells you about God. Uh, Psalm 147, verse 5. Great is our Lord, abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. Psalm 90, verse 2, before the mountains were brought forth or ever you were, uh, had formed the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. See, there he is. He's eternal. He existed beforehand. 
And then Isaiah 40, verses 10 through 14, and then verses 28 through 31. I didn't have time to put the whole chapter in. Read that whole chapter this week. But let me, let me just read these and see if you pick up on some of these attributes of who God is. Behold, the Lord God comes with might. That's his almighty power. And his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. He's holy, he's just, he's righteous. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arm. He's tender and loving. He is love. He will carry them in his bosom. Whenever you feel like that God has left you alone, you need to look down and realize that you're not walking alone. There's only one set of footsteps there. And he's carrying you in his bosom. When you face difficulty in life and storms, he's right there carrying you in his bosom. That's what the Bible says anyway. Um, Who has measured, I love this, who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand. Can you imagine that, how great that is? He's like, Atlantic Ocean, Pacific, Mm. Indian. I mean, can you imagine that? The, but I want you to, uh, the next part I love even more. It says that in the hollow of his hand, and marked off the heavens with a span. Now, some of you may not know what that is. A span was an Old Testament measuring unit. And you know where they got it? It was the tip of the pinky to the tip of the thumb. Now, I want you to get how easy it was for God to create the universe. He goes, let's see. I'm going to create the heavens, the, the billions and billions of stars, um, the, the millions of galaxies, and I think it'll fit about right there. Can you imagine that? That just blows my mind. He is so powerful. He is so knowledgeable. He is so loving. Uh, he measures uh, the heavens with a span. It closed the dust of the earth in a measure and weighed the mountains and scales and the hills in a balance. In other words, it was so easy for him. It was so easy for him. He's like, yeah, that's about right. Yeah, that's about right. And I love it in Genesis. Go read the, the creation account. It talks about creation. He created the heavens and the earth and it talks about uh, the days of creation and all this stuff. And I love this. And it just almost is like an afterthought. Here's what the Bible says. And I love this. Oh, and he created the stars also. What? Wait, this, you talk about the universe, you talk about the creation of everything and time and, and matter, and it's like, oh yeah, he created the stars also. Oh, almost forgot he created the universe and he took, oh, about that long to do it. Oh yeah, about a span. The power of God is unfathomable. That's why we can know the nature of God. Uh, It says, um, whom should he consult? Who made him understand? Who taught him the path of justice and taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? That's his righteousness, his morality, uh, all of these things, his justice, his holiness. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint. We're getting ready to come to a very famous verse. And I want you to see it in the context of what God thinks and knows and believes about you. Because we've seen his power and his holiness and his righteousness, his eternality, uh, and his love. Listen to what it says. He gives power to the faint. You ever just get... Tired? You ever just think, I don't know if I keep on going or not. You ever just get to the point that you're like, I'm throwing in the towel. It's not worth it. I can't handle it anymore. There's very good news for every one of us. He gives power to the faint. And to him who has no might, you have to forgive me because... This is so amazing to me. It's so powerful. I can hardly contain it. He gives um, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youth shall faint and be weary, and young men shall be exhausted. But those who wait on the Lord uh, shall renew their strength, and they shall mount up with wings like eagles, and they shall run and not be weary. 
and they shall walk and not faint. That's the nature of God and how much he loves you and how powerful he is. Um, I've got here some names of God and they are very powerful. And if I had time, I would spend a lot of time (laughs) preaching on the names of God because it helps you understand the character of God and his nature and his attributes. I'm not going to I'm not going to preach this. I'm just going to read this, and you can go back and think about it, study it later on. Uh, and this is just simply for sake of time. These are the names, some of the names of God from the Old Testament that help us understand. Jehovah Jireh means the Lord will provide. You ever have a need? God can provide. Uh, Jehovah Shalom, the Lord is peace. You ever have a storm? God can give peace. Um, Jehovah Nisi, the Lord is my banner. In other words, he intimidates the enemy. He encourages those that are discouraged, and he waves his victory banner over us. And every time, every time that the devil accuses you, and by the way, he is the accuser of the brethren. Every time he tries to point out your sin, and every time he tries to point out your failures, and every time He tries to point out how you have sinned and you have made a mistake. You just remember that Jehovah Nisi is right there and he puts his banner right over you. Oh, I love that. Um, He's Jehovah Rohi. The Lord is my shepherd. He carries you and loves you. Uh, He is Jehovah Shammah. The Lord is there. He never leaves you alone. He is Jehovah Sabaoth. The Lord, the commander of heaven's armies. He fights your battles for you. He is Jehovah Tidkenu. It means the Lord is our righteousness, which means that I have been forgiven through the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. He is Elohim, the mighty creator, the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He is El Shaddai, which means that he is God Almighty. He is Adonai, which means he is my father. He is Abba, which means he's my daddy. He is the one that loves me. He's not just some stern figure that uh, has control over my life, but he has a relationship with me and loves me and will not give me bad gifts. Oh, Jesus said, if we being evil know how to give good gifts to our children, how much more does the Heavenly Father know how to give good gifts to those who ask? All you got to do is ask. All you got to do is ask. All you got to do is trust Him. All you got to do is believe in Him. All you got to do is believe that He is who He says He is. And God promises that He'll be right there with you. Well, the last thing is this. Does God really have a purpose? What is the purpose of God? Well, I want you to understand that the Bible is very clear that God has no needs. He didn't create the church because he was lonely (laughs) or humans because he needed to talk to somebody. Um, God has no imperfection. Uh, Father, Son, and Spirit, perfect fellowship with each other, uh, perfect serving of each other. But he loves us so much that he wanted us to experience love. People ask me often, why did God give mankind a free will in the Garden of Eden? Because of love. See, God is so concerned that you love him and he created you to love you forever. The fact is that he even, and he knew what would happen and he predestined before the foundation of the world. And for those of you that or Calvinist, or Reformed theology, or Arminian theology. People ask me what I am. I say I'm both. Because I believe that God knew everything in eternity past. He knew me before I was ever born. He knew me before I ever got saved. He knew that I was going to be a part of his adopted. He knew that he had predestined me before my parents ever ever even came together. He knew that he had a purpose for my life, but he also loved me so much that he gave me a choice. He gave me a free will. You see, it is impossible for a computer to love because a computer is programmed. It has no free will. But God loved Adam and Eve so much that he gave them a free will. And he loved us so much that even though they blew it, even though they sinned, you know what God did? He sent his only begotten son to die on the cross to make us right with God to salvage that relationship, to bring us back to life. Jesus did not come to make you moral. Jesus did not come to make you turn over a new leaf. Jesus came 
to bring dead things to life. You were dead in sin. You were dead spiritually. And God loves you so much that he said, Richie, you're now part of my family. Richie, you're now forgiven. Richie, I don't see your sin anymore. Richie, you're going to be right with the Heavenly Father. Richie, you're forgiven. That's what he saw. And that's what he sees when he sees you. What is his purpose? Well, that's easy. He made you to love you forever. He created you to have a relationship with you. And he created you to be a part of his family. Now, sadly, there are those that reject him. But make no mistake, God's purpose was you. God's purpose in this universe was you. And don't ever forget it. When you feel alone, when you feel your faith being shaky, when you feel your confidence crumbling, remember that God's purpose is you. It's you. It's you. He died for you. He thought of you. He knew you before the world was ever created. Why? Because that is his purpose. His purpose is you. Revelation 4, verse 11, it says, you, God created everything, and it is for your pleasure that they exist and were created. And then Ephesians 1, 4, long before he laid down earth's foundations, he had us in mind. Isn't that amazing? Long before the universe, long before the stars, he had you in mind. He's thinking about you. And, and you know, just give me a second with some holy imagination. I think he was thinking details about you. Hey, I, I'm going to take old Richie. And I'm going to let him be six feet, one inches tall. And I'm going to give him brown hair, except for the ones that have turned gray or turned loose so far. And I'm going to give him blue eyes. I'm going to let him be born to Roger and Linda Miller. And you know what? Roger, not going to be a Christian when Richie was born. Far from me, drunk, basically. But I'm going to save his dad. And you know what else I'm going to do? I'm going to save Richie. And he's going to live with me forever. And I, in fact, I'm going to use him. I've got a purpose for his life. And I'm going to let him pastor a church. And I'm going to let him point some people to Jesus. And when he gets to heaven, we're going to celebrate. We're going to celebrate. You know, he had you in mind. He knew exactly what you are going to look like. He knew exactly how much you were going to weigh. And gain and lose and gain and lose I've been on so many diets in my life I told my wife if I die it's going to be cancer with a stretch mark you know so but friend listen God was thinking about you before you were ever born he was thinking about you and so today I hope that you will follow him for those of you that are online listen closely God loves you more than you can imagine. He has a greater plan for your life than you have for your life. And you need to trust him. Those of you in the room are the same. If you've never trusted Christ as your savior, if you've never responded to the character of God and the love of God and the work of Jesus Christ, I want to challenge you right now. Today is your day. Today is the greatest day in the history of your life because today is going to be the day that you give your life to Jesus Christ. And he's going to change you and he's going to take your dead spirit that is far from him and he's going to make you anew. You say, Richie, I want that. Well, pray something like this. Dear Jesus, I know you knew me before I was ever born. And God, you chose me before the foundation of the world. But I want to trust you today. And by faith... I receive your finished work on the cross. Jesus, thank you for dying and resurrecting again for me. And I ask you to save me right now. Friend, if you prayed that prayer online, click that button that let us know that you prayed to receive Christ. If in the room today you prayed that prayer to receive Christ, take one of the next step cards and put your name on it. Drop it in the drop box on the way out. And in fact, we also have baptism today. Uh, and we have it available. Uh, There are some of you that maybe you need to be baptized today. I want to challenge you. 
right now, if you'd like to be baptized, it'll be after the service. Uh, you get up and go to the bathrooms, and there's going to be somebody there that will help you. So I didn't bring any clothes to be baptized. We have clothes for you to change into. We have towels for you to dry off with. We have hair dryers for you to dry your hair if you don't want to go outside with wet hair, okay? You can do this today. And I want to challenge you. If you've not experienced believer's baptism, in other words, if you have not been baptized since you received Christ as your Savior, I want you to do it today, 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 okay? Uh, and we'll baptize you right after the service if you'd like to be baptized today, all right? And so I would encourage you to, to do that. And I also want to encourage you today to take your next steps. You say, Richie, what is the next step? Well, if you're new to Avalon, online, fill out the next step card. In person, fill out the next step card. If you've never filled out one before, it'll help us get you connected. Sign up for the next step class. Sign up. Once you don't have to sign up for baptism, you get baptized today. Sign up for a ministry. Sign up for a small group. Anything that you'd like to be involved in in this church, you use this to help take your next step, and it'll be a powerful, powerful way for you to get connected. If you have a prayer request, there's a place for prayer requests on here, and you can fill that out as well. And so uh, I want to encourage you now uh, to take your next steps. And I'm going to end with this statement, and I've gone over, and that's okay. Um, I want to end with this next step, and I want you to think about this, and I say this often here at Avalon Church. And no, it is not original with me. Very few things are. Uh, A.W. Tozier is the one that came up with this. But I say it uh, that, you know, the first time you give a quote, uh, you're, you're quoting the author of it, and that's called, you know, that's called research. Um, the second time, you say, well, you know, it's, it's always been said, and you give the quote, and by the third time, you say, you know, I always say, and, and so I say that, but here's the quote, and I want you to think about this. The most important thing about you is what you believe about God. The most important thing about you is what you believe about God. Do you believe God is a tyrant? Do you believe that he is not a loving God? Do you believe that he's forgotten about you? Do you believe he wants to zap you upside the head every chance he gets? Or do you get the picture of God from the Bible like he actually is, the most overwhelmingly loving being in the universe? God loves you. And I can't think of a better message than that. And so today, as I end in prayer, maybe you need a bigger view of God. I'm hoping that people online and those in the service receive Christ. But for the rest of us that have already done this, listen, maybe what you need this week is a bigger view of God. I, I spend my life trying to get a bigger view of God. And maybe that's what you need. And you'd say, Richie, pray for me. I want this week to have a bigger view of God. I want to see him as great and loving and kind. I want to see him like he is. Maybe you're going through a difficult time and you're struggling with that. But you say, my prayer this week, my takeaway this week is that I want a bigger view of God. Would you raise your hand? Anybody like that? God bless you. Heavenly Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would give us a bigger and better view of you, that you'd help us to understand who you are. We'll never get our minds completely around it, but God, help us to love you. Help us to build on the building block of your love and of who you are. And Lord, we'll thank you and praise you for what you do. Of course, in Jesus' name that we pray and ask all these things. Amen. Thanks for joining us at Avalon Church. Share this message with a friend and make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single video. You can also join us every Sunday live on the Avalon Church Facebook page. If you feel led to give and support our mission of bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, you can do so by clicking the Give button. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time.